This week on Radio KD8TTE, we continue our discussion of obstacles to high-frequency or shortwave radio communication. Our topic this week is HF fading. It can happen when any two stations have established a circuit, but the signal fades out and they are unable to hear each other. Similarly, you can have something where it will fade in when you weren't listening for that in the first place. This is driven by space weather, and specifically, geomagnetic storms can have this effect. What is the impact on us as radio operators, and what can we do about it? Stick around. In our last episode of Radio KD8 TTE, we talked about space weather and the effect that solar flares can have on our radio signal strength. That is, when we are sending a shortwave radio signal up to the ionosphere at the F layer for refraction back to Earth, the D layer absorbs the signal on the way up and absorbs some more on the way back down. NOAA uses its R scale to indicate that there is HF blackout going on and also the level of blackout. Today we're going to be talking about fading. That's going to come from geomagnetic storms and the G scale that NOAA publishes for that. Let's take a look first at what geomagnetic storms are, how they impact HF communication, and we'll set things up for our next episode where we will show how to work through geomagnetic storms and HF fading. The Earth is surrounded not only by a multi-layered atmosphere, but also by a kind of bubble of electromagnetic energy called the magnetosphere. The sun emits energized particles in all directions. The flow of particles is called solar wind. The magnetosphere helps to normalize the electromagnetic energy that makes it to Earth, as much of that power will go around the Earth and continue on into space. Ionized particles that make it to the atmosphere interact with the ionosphere, as we discussed in our last episode. Bursts of energy from the sun can interact with the F layer of the ionosphere and make it unstable. That means that the amount of power and angle of your signal refraction from the ionosphere can vary. The result is that you have a signal that you are receiving strong go weak and suddenly fade out even. You can also, over the course of a few seconds, have a signal that you weren't even listening for fade in. A few seconds later, signals can fade back again to where they were just a few seconds before. The burst of particles and resulting instability is called a geomagnetic storm. Space weather watchers look closely at these for several reasons. One reason is that the interaction of these particles with the ionosphere can take place at frequencies on the electromagnetic spectrum that include visible light. Aurora, the northern and southern lights, come as a result. Another reason is that the changes in particle density can affect how efficiently satellites orbit the Earth and how radio waves refract. Strong storms also affect things on Earth like power and communication lines, which can act like antenna systems receiving and carrying that additional power. A very strong geomagnetic storm on the 1st and 2nd of September 1859 created auroral lights that were seen even near the equator. Telegraph lines received and carried so much energy that some operators got electric shocks, pylons threw sparks, and some circuits were able to run entirely from auroral current disconnected from normal power. Some stations even reported fires. To provide useful information to communities affected by space weather, NOAA uses a scale to indicate geomagnetic storms and their intensity. When a geomagnetic storm is active, NOAA reports it on a scale of 1 to 5. Forecasts for aurora show the location and probability of aurora as well as the intensity on a 5-point scale. That scale is helpful for many communities interested in space weather. The scale describes effects of each level of intensity on power systems, spacecraft operations, and other systems, including HF radio. The scales also include how often the storms occur during each 11-year solar cycle. 
in the early morning hours of the 4th of September 2022, as observed from Ohio's clock, NOAA issued an alert showing a geomagnetic storm reaching intensity of G2. The alert indicated the affected area north of 55 degrees geomagnetic latitude and a brief description of the effects. For HF radio, that means fading at higher latitudes. Where I am in central Ohio is about 40 degrees north geographically. But remember, geographic and geomagnetic poles are not the same and geomagnetic poles move over time. Geomagnetically in 2022, I'm at about 49 degrees north, which gets me much closer to the area of concern. About two and a half hours later, NOAA issued another alert indicating geomagnetic storms at the G2 level. About four hours after that, NOAA issued another alert, again showing G2 magnetic storms. So while I am not at 55 degrees geomagnetic latitude or higher, I thought that I was probably close enough that I would see some effects. It's not like 55 degrees is a hard line. Everything on one side has problems and everything on the other side is completely free of problems. There could be a situation where I'm in a net that has a station that is north of 55 degrees geomagnetic latitude, and so it would be hard for me to work that station. Let's listen to some audio. Let's hear the effect. We'll talk about voice procedure and digital procedure to work around in the next episode. Today, we're going to focus on the impact. First, we turn our attention to CHU at 7850 kilohertz. We have a nice strong signal there, and we are able to focus on that signal to hear how things change in a very short period of time. Notice that at the bottom in the waterfall, the background yellow will have a brief period where it comes up outside of the signal. That's where the noise level increases, and here comes another wave. This shows where there is a change in the signal-to-noise ratio, although the signal is still strong enough to stay well above the noise. All right, we're going to take a look at another example where we can both see and hear the signal. We have two stations in Ohio operating at 5 megahertz in the middle of the day, and you can see and hear the signal as it's fading in, becoming stronger, and after a few seconds, it begins to fade out again. The condition of fading that we have here is that a station may be able to read the transmission, but then will lose the signal and then not be able to follow. And then as the signal fades back in, it's able to be picked up again. The result is an incomplete receipt of a transmission. So as we talk about effective HF or shortwave communication, we saw how near vertical incidence skywave NVIS propagation can be very effective. We do have some obstacles that we need to concern ourselves with. Last week, we talked about HF radio blackout. This week, we were able to listen to fading, understand what's going on, why it happens, how to recognize it. And next week, we're going to talk about how to work effectively through conditions where fading is happening thanks to geomagnetic storms. I hope that you liked the video. Please share it and hit the like button if you did. Subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss any of our content and continue to follow us with the training. Until next time, this is Radio KD8 TTE.